my overall goal is to create AI systems that are more practical and have positive real world impact. Stronger models alone is not actually going to be enough in many cases uh, to get the, the real world systems, the real world progress that we want, or at least not, not get it as fast as we want. So we see an example of that uh, in Go, where you have this superhuman model, Nor normally it's superhuman anyways, but then it has these uh, catastrophic failures in some situations. All right, so hello everyone, and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer, I'm a data scientist at IWOCA, and I will be your host. So today, our guest is Kellen Pellerin. He is a research scientist at FAR AI, and he is also a PhD at MILA, the Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute. On top of this, he is also a Go player, and he recently managed to beat Katago, a superhuman AI engine, 14 games to one, and we'll definitely talk about AI and Go in this episode. So if you enjoy the show, please subscribe to the AI Stories YouTube channel and leave a five-star review. So now, just before we start, just wanted to let you know that this is a special episode. This is actually the last episode of season two of AI Stories. We'll take a break, but we'll be back after the summer for lots of amazing new guests and lots of fun. All right, so let's start the conversation now. Hi, Kellen. How is it going? How are you today? Hi, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No, my pleasure. Very happy to have you for this last episode of season two. First thing I want to ask is how did you get into this world of data science and AI? How did you actually get into the field? Well, so it sort of happened over a few years, but uh, there's actually a, a strong connection to Go. Uh, so I would say the, the first time I really got interested in it, especially, was uh, watching the AlphaGo versus Lee Sedol uh, match. Uh, so I watched all of those games live and thought it was super cool how the, the AI could uh, be so good at Go. Uh, and so that sort of inspired my interest uh, in AI and machine learning in general. Uh, that said, though, at the time, I was pretty busy uh, with finishing up an uh, undergrad and master's in uh, economics and math. Uh, and I didn't really uh, pursue AI uh, immediately. Uh, but then uh, a few years later, I was... Uh, starting a, a PhD in uh, economics, uh, and I took some uh, classes in AI and felt that, uh, at least for me personally, I, I could have a bigger impact uh, working in AI than in uh, economics. So I, I decided to, to switch fields, uh, uh, learn more about AI, and uh, eventually that's uh, led me to where I am now. So you're mentioning this Go game. So I guess we can dive a bit into Go first before talking into talking about your research. Um, first of all, just to make sure we're all on the same page, can you give a brief introduction of what the game of Go is? What is it? And what is so exciting about Go? Sure. So the, it's a, a board game. It's kind of similar to chess. Uh, it's two players uh, that take turns uh, playing on a board. Uh, compared to chess, though, uh, the board is a, a lot bigger, uh, so the games tend to last a, lo a lot longer and uh, in many ways can be a, a lot more complicated. Uh, so it's been played for thousands of years, uh, especially in uh, Asia, where it's uh, uh, very popular. And I would say, at least for me personally, uh, so I've played Go for a, a long time, uh, and I uh, quite enjoy it. It's uh, fun to uh, try and outsmart your opponent uh, to see uh, uh, amazing new moves that you didn't think of uh, and just uh, enjoyable all around, I guess. So do you play at a quite high level? Uh, I guess it depends on uh, who you compare me with. Uh, I definitely uh, played competitively in the past. Uh, so I, I'm, uh, uh, I guess, uh, at one of the higher levels for amateurs in the US. Uh, that said, the, the, the players in Asia are usually uh, stronger than the, the, the U.S. and uh, the West in, in general. Uh, so there's lots of people that are uh, much stronger than I am, too. And just again, to have a good understanding of the game. So like chess, you have pieces, but they're all the same. And how do you beat your opponent? How does this work, actually? 
So the the overall goal, it, it depends a bit on how you uh, frame it uh, with the different rules, but basically the, the overall goal for all of them is uh, you want to control the most uh, uh, of the board as possible. And if you control more than your opponent at the end, uh, then you win. Uh, but the, the tricky part comes in because if you're able to surround your opponent's uh, stones, or so surround your opponent's pieces, we usually call them stones, then you get to capture them and take them off the board. Uh, so they no longer help the opponent anymore. Uh, so that makes things quite complicated because uh, both people can be trying to capture each other at the same time they're trying to take control of the board overall. All right, so two things here, taking control of the board and capturing your opponent's pieces to remove them from the board. Yeah, I would say that those are sort of the, the two key things. So the, the overall objective is control the, the, the most uh, uh, of the board uh, as possible, but uh, the, the capturing is sort of a, the, the key element that makes uh, uh, it complex and the key way you sort of uh, fight with your opponent, either trying to attack them or defend your own stones and prevent them from being captured. So zooming in a bit on this Lissedol against AlphaGo game, again, just to bring everyone on the same page, in 2016, there has been a game between AlphaGo, which is an AI algorithm built by DeepMind, and they, well, AlphaGo actually defeated Lissedol, which is probably one of the best Go play, which was one of the best Go player in the world. At that time, I don't know if he still is. Um, but AlphaGo defeated Lissedol four games to one. Um, AI beats human, and that's quite a big surprise. This is probably one of the biggest thing, AI thing of the 21st century. Quite a big thing in AI. Everyone talked about this. There is a good Netflix documentary. So you mentioned that you actually watch this game live. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so they were, uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, they were a bit late at night now. Uh, but I definitely didn't want to miss them. Uh, so I watched the the game itself and then uh, live uh, commentary by some uh, uh, top players. And before the game, what did you think? What was your thinking before the game? Did you think that AI would win? Did you think that Lissedol would easily win? What did you think before this game? So I, I guess I wasn't 100% sure, but I, I would definitely uh, I was definitely thinking that Lissedol would win. Uh, because we'd sort of had a long history of uh, attempts at uh, Go bots, uh, Go uh, AIs of some sort uh, that didn't work that well. Uh, so when I started, the the, the Go AIs uh, were not even as good as a, a strong amateur. Uh, and then over time, they got maybe close to the strong amateur level, uh, strongest amateur level. But e even then, the, the, the really top amateurs would still beat them. Uh, never mind the, the professionals uh, or the top players like Lee Sedol. Uh, so there was a, a, a really big gap uh, between the, the level that the AIs were at uh, at the time, excluding AlphaGo, uh, and, and the, the top human players. So I, I think, uh, uh, at least speaking for myself, but I think uh, maybe many people in the Go community, maybe the majority, uh, thought it was m more likely that uh, Lee Sedol would win than uh, AlphaGo. And so what did you think about the game, like what did you feel and what what excited you so much about AI? And because you mentioned that this is why you wanted to move in the field later on. Yeah, definitely. So I, I guess uh, during during the game, so it was a, a five game match, uh, like you mentioned before. And the, I think uh, at least my personal impression was uh, the first game. So the AFCO won the first game. Uh, but uh, I wasn't uh, completely convinced uh, after the first game uh, because it was like, well, you know, was it really that AlphaGo played so well, or was it just that Lee Sedol was uh, not having a good game, right? Maybe he was uh, a bit uneasy uh, uh, playing the, the AI system. Uh, so I would say it was after after it won the second game uh, that it really seemed convincing. Like, yeah, it really is uh, that good. Uh, it, it really is uh, at the the top human level and maybe superhuman. Uh, and then, of course, later, definitely superhuman. Uh, and I would say, uh, the, so in, in the second game, uh, it played a, a particularly uh, inspiring move. Uh, so it was something that definitely wasn't typical for uh, human strategies at the time, uh, but was actually a really good move. And I think uh, seeing that and then just in general other moves uh, that it's come up with uh, has been really awesome. Uh, 
that it can come up with all these new ideas that, that we haven't thought of, uh, or even realize that ideas that we have thought of, but didn't think were that good actually are uh, that good. Uh, so it, it's come up with a, tons of new things and really changed the way uh, uh, humans now uh, play Go as well. Yeah, interesting. I think it's almost like in chess, like the engine comes up with some move that you think aren't really good. And then you realize because those algorithms can see 10, 15, 20 moves ahead, if not more. Um, and so, well, thanks to those algorithms, you realize new moves and you almost discover new parts of the game. Yeah, exactly. You can learn a, a lot from them and, and find a, a new, really cool uh, things from them, like you said. And just thinking, did this not discourage you from playing Go? Like once you realize that, well, AI is just better than humans, is there still a point in, in playing Go? I would say uh, for me, it, it wasn't uh, particularly discouraging. Uh, because the, I, I saw it more as like an opportunity to learn things uh, and, and like we were just talking about, uh, uh, learn new moves, new strategies. Uh, so I, I guess uh, that definitely varies person to person. Uh, uh, I think uh, some people maybe feel like the, if we can't be the, the top, then uh, uh, no point trying. But uh, it, at least for me, I, I think it was more uh, uh, inspiring and and fun to see all the, the new moves uh, rather than discouraging. Okay, so you watch this game, you get interested by AI and you end up getting into the field. And as I mentioned at the beginning, very recently you defeated Katago, which is a superhuman AI engine, 14 games to one. Um, do you want to talk about this research? I think you did some AI research around this. So do you want to talk about this research and how you managed to defeat an AI algorithm? Um, well, five, well, seven years after Lisedol, AlphaGo beats Lisedol. Sure, yeah. Uh, so basically what we did is uh, we created a, a new AI system to find weaknesses in the the Katago, the, the GoPlane AI system. Uh, and I say we loosely here because the, the project started uh, before I joined. Uh, so a, a, a huge chunk of the work had already been uh, done by that time, uh, when I joined that is. So uh, basically the, the way that this uh, new system worked was it, it, it simulated the Katago and figured out what it was going to play and then looked for uh, weaknesses, look, look for ways to beat it. And it found a strategy that seemed to work really well and was actually understandable by humans. So I was able to see how the, the strategy worked and learn to do it myself. And then by doing it myself uh, in, a, in the, those games that, that you mentioned before, uh, without any AI assistance uh, in real time, uh, I was able to beat uh, the, the top system, uh, uh, the majority of the games. So using AI to try to beat another AI algorithm. Yeah, exactly. And so what was its weakness? Like, how did you, how did you find it out? And yeah, what was its, the weakness of Katago? So our system uh, searched uh, some different possibilities or, or rather, so it wasn't trained. We, we didn't give it any uh, information in advance. It was just looking for something itself. Uh, and it, it found a, a few different options uh, throughout the training process, but then it, it finally settled on uh, the one that uh, worked very well and, and that I was able to use. And that was that it seems that Katago, and we later found out other uh, top Go, Go Plane AIs, seem to struggle to uh, judge groups that have some sort of loop. So like a, a donut shape almost. So, so we call them uh, cyclic groups but basically it's a, a group that goes around and connects back to itself. And it, it seems like uh, for some reason, they think that those groups are invincible basically. So because they think they're invincible, that means they, they never see a need to defend them. And because they don't defend, then I and other humans, uh, as well as the, our uh, attacking uh, uh, AI system can surround the group and then capture it 
uh, like, like I mentioned before when we were talking about the, the rules of the game and how the game worked. And so by capturing that, that big donut shaped group, uh, we take the whole, whole group, a whole bunch of uh, the opponent's pieces off the board, and that gives a, a big advantage that, that leads to a win, so a, a game winning advantage. Okay, so you basically by reapplying the same strategy all the time, well, by attacking this donut, as you explained, you manage to actually easily beat an AI algorithm, whereas you wouldn't be able to as easily beat a human, I guess. A human will notice that um, the donut gets attacked and will try to defend it. That's right, yeah. So even an intermediate level human uh, would easily see that there's some sort of danger uh, and judge the position correctly and, and defend at some point. Uh, so, so there's really lots of opportunities along the way to to easily defend the group. Uh, so you, you would definitely expect that the, the superhuman system uh, would uh, see that something's wrong and, and take one of those opportunities, but for some reason it, it isn't able to see it. So it's sort of a, a blind spot for it. Can you intuitively explain why, like those are superhuman AI algorithms that have played, I don't know, billions of games. How comes that they cannot spot something as obvious as this, like that an intermediate human player can can see? That's a good question, and we don't have a, a certain answer to it. So there's maybe two two things uh, that one would think of. The, the first one that doesn't seem to be the case, or at least not on its own, is just that it hasn't seen it uh, before. So these sorts of positions, they're not unheard of. Uh, they've definitely come up in the past uh, in plenty of human games, but they're they're still uh, very rare, uh, not common at all. So the the first thought that many people have is that maybe it just hasn't seen them before, uh, or it hasn't seen enough of them before. Uh, so as long as it can see some of them, then it'll realize the issue and, and fix itself. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, I mean, it's probably. Part of the issue that it just doesn't see them enough, uh, but in our experience so far, uh, doing different tests and also in work uh, from the uh, main developer of Catago, uh, who's been working on this as well, it, it seems like just having it see some of these positions uh, isn't enough, or at least so far it hasn't been enough. It, it definitely makes it less vulnerable, but it, it doesn't fix it entirely. Uh, again, this is at least so far, maybe eventually, if we do it for a long enough time, it, it, it will. Uh, but it seems to be like a, you would need a, a ton of training. Uh, so, so that's the, the hypothesis that's maybe part of it, but can't be the, the full explanation, it seems like. So the, the other hypothesis is more on just uh, what it's sort of thinking or, or or what what it's uh, how it's doing its sort of evaluation. So the the thought is that when you have this group that uh, forms a loop, uh, so like I said, you know, it goes around and connects back to itself, and you could keep going around if you wanted to. And so the idea is that maybe somehow the the bot is basically doing that. So it it, it starts at one spot on the loop, goes all the way around, and gets back to the starting point, and then. For some reason, it doesn't realize that it's seen the entire group, uh, and so it keeps going around again, and uh, it, it counts like how much space it has left uh, uh, a second time, and then it goes around a third time and counts how much space it has left uh, a third time and keeps going like that. So eventually, it thinks it has tons of room left. Uh, there's, you know, it, it has like you know a hundred spaces left, and the, the opponent would have to fill in before it would be captured. When in reality, maybe it only has one or two left. Uh, so for that reason, it thinks that there's no danger when there really is a lot of danger. So th that's the the hypothesis, anyways. Uh, we haven't been able to uh, completely confirm that uh, uh, one way or another uh, so far, uh, and it's not exactly clear uh, how mechanically it, it does that because there isn't some component of the the system that would actually you know, like phys physically go around and, and get stuck going around. Uh, but it, anyways, that that's the, the hypothesis because it does seem that it, like the, the loop is very significant. So if you just break the loop, uh, then it seems to usually uh, realize that 
uh, there's some danger or something like that. So some kind of risk underestimation, like basically it's open and is close to capturing it, but the algorithm thinks that um, basically they're still far away from that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it thinks that there's no danger, uh, even when it gets uh, close to being captured, like you said. So very interesting what you said. And I'm just wondering, do you think then that Catago or other AI algorithms have really an understanding of the game of Go? Or is it more kind of learning by heart different positions and because they play one billion of games, they're actually good, but they don't actually fully understand the game of Go? I think that's a, a tricky question because uh, it's not not that easy to, to say what uh, we mean by understand. Uh, I, I think we can definitely say that they don't understand the game in a, a way that a human does. Uh, because indeed, like we see here, a, a human wouldn't make this sort of mistake or, or generally wouldn't make this sort of mistake. Uh, that the, the AI system that in theory should be much better in normal conditions, it's much better than the humans uh, does. Uh, so the, does make this mistake. Uh, but but saying that it, it's only uh, memorize the games, I, I think that that would be too far. Uh, I think it is able to learn learn patterns and it, it can definitely uh, play well in, in games that aren't exactly the ones it's memorized. Because e even though it has seen uh, uh, millions, billions, uh, I'm not even sure how many games, Exactly. It's still only a, a drop in the bucket compared to all the, the possible games on the Go board. Uh, so I, I think a, a common uh, uh, figure that people quote is that there's more possible games to Go than uh, atoms in the universe mm -hmm. or something like that. So it, most of the time, uh, it seems like, it, it, at least in uh, everyone's experience so far, uh, when it does encounter some game that, it, that doesn't uh, match one that it's seen during training, it still plays well. Uh, it's only this particular uh, uh, type of uh, uh, situation that it, it doesn't seem to play well in, or, or per perhaps a, a couple others, but this is the one that's uh, the most consistently uh, uh, replicable uh, without using like a, a very specific sequence and that leads to a, a game winning advantage. And so what do you think Overall, do you think that this is then those algorithms are actually intelligent, more intelligent than humans? What's what's your take on this? With ChatGPT, we start to think more and more about about that. So yeah, what's what's your take on this? So I think that's uh, beyond uh, uh, my understanding uh, currently. So I I don't really have a, a great answer for that. Uh, I I think uh, certainly we could say that in some areas, uh, like in Go under normal uh, conditions, they can perform a, at a superhuman level. Uh, so in that sense, perhaps uh, they can be more intelligent than humans. On the other hand, we also see that, uh, again, like in Go, but uh, also in general, there's cases where they can they don't perform uh, at a human level. So they, they could be uh, dumber than uh, humans and, and make mistakes that, that humans wouldn't make. Uh, so uh, I think that that's sort of the my key takeaway anyways. Uh, so right now it's kind of an open problem to build systems that are both superhuman in general and are completely reliable and robust. They don't have uh, some sort of weaknesses uh, like we've seen in Go. So it, one might hope that just making it superhuman enough uh, maybe doing lots of computation, maybe training it in a, a sort of adversarial competitive process like Go, uh, so where, where it's trying to, to beat uh, itself, uh, would be enough to get really reliable uh, systems that don't have weaknesses. But as we've seen here, that's definitely not the case. And, and so, uh, of course, in, in Go, it, even if it fails catastrophically, it just loses the game. Uh, but if you think about self-driving cars or precision medicine or, or many other applications, uh, failures like this uh, have serious consequences. So the, the hope is that eventually uh, uh, we can develop systems that are smarter than humans, perhaps one could say, uh, consistently, rather than sometimes smarter and sometimes uh, not as smart. So is that the overall 
goal of this research, basically trying to make algorithms more robust? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, so the hope is that uh, what we learned here uh, with Go can eventually be applied to other areas, especially safety critical areas, like some of the examples that I mentioned and, and many others. Yeah, since the risk, I guess, would be that we think those algorithms are super re reliable, but uh, perhaps there is a few particular cases where they are completely breaking. And in Go, that might not be a big issue. The algorithm will lose the game, but for a self-driving car or something like that, the issue is obviously much bigger. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so we, we really need uh, better systems, uh, more reliable systems, and also lots of thorough testing. Uh, so even if the, it does make mistakes sometimes, the, that doesn't mean it, it is, can't be an improvement. Uh, for instance, in self-driving cars, you, you can imagine a, a self-driving car that crashes sometimes, maybe it's still less than humans crash. Uh, so that's a good thing overall. But if you imagine a self-driving car that, you know, whenever it sees a pedestrian that's wearing a certain color shirt, it runs mm -hmm. them over or something like that, uh, then that's a, a big problem. Uh, so we need uh, testing and better systems that uh, avoid uh, issues like that. And like more going more into the details, how do you find robustness issues in algorithms? Like what kind of algorithms do you use to spot those issues? So I, I'm not a, a completely an expert on the, the field as a whole, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, what we did here in Go is basically applying an optimization pressure. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, making a, another algorithm that, that searches for weaknesses, uh, like I touched on before. Uh, so, so this algorithm is doing its own optimization. Uh, so the, the, the base uh, uh, original Go system is you know, trying to win. Uh, and then the, we come in with this other algorithm that's also trying to win. It's trying to particularly beat the, the, the original algorithm. And if it can find ways to, to do that, and especially ways that could be a, a real world issue, uh, like we see here where like a, a human can uh, actually uh, repeat it, uh, or, or I shouldn't say repeat uh, because it's not, not exact repetition, but uh, learn the strategy and, and implement it, uh, then that can help us uh, figure out what are the, the vulnerabilities and ultimately how can we fix them. Uh, so, and, and that's a, a more general thing than just Go. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, uh, researchers have developed tools in, in many different areas that, that look for uh, vulnerabilities uh, in this sort of adversarial process. So adversarial uh, uh, examples, uh, it's often called, uh, and, and try to find uh, where things go wrong and then ultimately, what, what can we do to make things better? So, so that, that's one way. Uh, definitely a, a, another way uh, uh, is just doing a bunch of testing uh, and, and look for, for mistakes. Uh, so going beyond uh, just looking at the, the aggregate statistics, for example, but looking at like how does it perform on uh, particularly hard cases or how does it perform uh, uh, for different groups uh, because we don't want it to, to work well for some people but not for other people, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and try to uh, find issues there and ultimately see what we can do to fix them. Yeah, interesting. There is like a famous saying that averages always lie and obviously you can get a good overall performance, but for those systems like self-driving cars, you really want them to be robust to specific cases. And I think even in general, I'm doing this for lots of data science analysis you always want to look at particular examples to see how your algorithm is doing. And also you want to look at particular examples where your algorithm is failing and try to understand why it fails. Um, sometimes looking at averages, you might think you have a very good algorithm. And then when you look at particular examples, you realize that it is dumb in some ways and uh, this can help you improve them further. Yeah, definitely. And so going back to the first approach of kind of trying to optimize your own algorithm to beat Katago, what kind of machine learning is that? Is this reinforcement learning or is it, again, as you mentioned, you mentioned something generative. So what kind of algorithm is behind this? Uh, so it is reinforcement learning. 
so it, it's actually very similar to the algorithm that Katago itself uses. Uh, so, so in fact, we take the, the same architecture, but there's two key differences. So first is that on its opponent, uh, opponent's turn, instead of simulating itself, it simulates its actual opponent, uh, which is, is Katago specifically in this case. Uh, so the reason that matters is because in the normal training process for Katago, uh, on its opponent tur opponent's turn, like I said, it just simulates itself, which totally makes sense because in that training, it actually is playing itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we want to do is make a, an algorithm that finds uh, weaknesses in Katago. Uh, so by simulating uh, what Katago is, is uh, thinking, what it's going to do, uh, then we can anticipate what it's going to play and and try to find something that's going to lead it uh, uh, into making mistakes. Uh, so, so that's the, the first key part. Uh, and then the second key part is just how the, the training process was set up. And there, it, it works a, a lot like a, a human trying to learn something complicated. So for instance, if you're learning math, you probably don't start with calculus, right? You would start with arithmetic, say, and then maybe learn algebra, trigonometry, et cetera. And, Basically, you, you build your way up. So what our approach does is almost the, the same thing. Uh, in this context, uh, though, what that means is that we start with a, an earlier version of Katago that wasn't as good. And we train against that, uh, trying to learn how to beat that one. And then gradually, we go to more recent versions that are better. And eventually, we get to the most recent version. So that's the, the best one. Uh, and then at that point, the, there's, a, of course, no more recent versions to, to keep increasing the, the level that way. But what we do then is scale up the amount of search. So the, the amount of moves that it investigates before it makes each of its moves. Uh, and, and so by doing this uh, progression, so this is a curriculum learning, it's called, uh, then that makes sure that the, the our algorithm isn't just losing all the time and never learning anything, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it, if it can never see any sort of weakness, if it never even comes close, uh, then it's very hard to learn. Uh, it, it would be like, a, again, like trying to learn calculus uh, uh, just directly. So, so we give it something easier so it can learn uh, some of the basics and then gradually scale it up until it can beat uh, even the, the top level uh, uh, version uh, with lot, uh, lots of uh, search uh, as well. Interesting. So you start simple, you make sure that your algorithm can actually be actually beat a simple version of Katago, and then you increase complexity step by step um, until you actually get an algorithm that can beat the superhuman Katago. That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. Super interesting. Just maybe one last question on the Go chapter. What are the next steps of this research then? You defeated Katago, you found some, well, some, I guess, weak points. What are the next steps there? What do you plan to look into in the future? So I'd say maybe three things. So the first one is how can we defend against this attack? Uh, so like I mentioned before, it, it seems like it's not as simple as just having it see some examples of the, the attack in action, having it see some examples of the, the board positions or the, the strategy being executed, uh, and then it would fix it. So that doesn't seem to work, uh, at least not, not, not directly. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're trying to do there is uh, uh, do more training, uh, training in different ways, and, and maybe change the, the architecture, uh, et cetera. And, and overall, uh, find something that will uh, give a, a really strong defense. Uh, so a defense that doesn't work uh, mm -hmm. just you know, some of the time, but, but can really uh, uh, fix the, the issue. Uh, so I think that, that's the, the first uh, uh, thing that we're working on. Uh, the second one is more understanding of why uh, this weakness appears. Uh, so we talked about the 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 sort of two hypotheses uh, before. Uh, the the one that just hasn't seen the, the position enough, which is probably part of it, but can't be the whole picture, it, it seems like. And then the the other that 
uh, somehow it, it gets stuck, like uh, effectively going around the, the the loop. And so, so we have you know some some guesses uh, there, some some information, but uh, uh, nothing conclusive. Uh, so, so the goal with this the second uh, 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 part of the the what we're working on is to try and get a better understanding there, uh, and ideally uh, get a, a conclusive understanding why it happens, and then uh, what we could do, what we could change, uh, so that it doesn't happen. Uh, so so the, those two points are sort of like what what can you do once you have the weakness, how can you fix it, uh, and then. Uh, what can you do to avoid the weakness happening in the first place? Uh, and hopefully, uh, it, at least ideally, uh, they would give insights that would uh, generalize uh, beyond Go as well. Uh, and then the, the third uh, uh, point uh, for future work, so I, I'm not working on this uh, uh, myself at, at the moment, uh, but some other people at uh, Far AI are, are working on this, is looking at other games and, and in general uh, other uh, uh, Context and, and situations, uh, and trying to understand uh, uh, what sort of weaknesses are there, uh, how they relate to to go or other things, and and again, uh, what can we do about them? Great. So yeah, thanks a lot. It was great to learn a bit more. I'm not very familiar with Go. I play chess um, a bit, but yeah, Go not very familiar, but super interesting. Let's now move to your research in general. So just to recap, you weren't really into AI, you were into Go, you watched the Lise Doll against AlphaGo game, you got interested in AI, you moved into the field, and you actually recently worked on this Go, well, robustness and algor robustness of Katago and how to beat it and in turn improve it. But in between this, you've also done a PhD. You're currently still doing your PhD, at, I believe, at Mila. And you've done other things. So let's talk about your PhD and your research in general. First question on this is just, what is your research about? Sure, sounds good. So at a high level, uh, my overall goal is to create AI systems that are more practical and have positive real world impact. Uh, so that's the goal. And then what I particularly focus on uh, to try and get there is look at the what we can do with the inputs and outputs, uh, as opposed to just the model in the, the middle. Uh, so uh, on the input side, uh, that means uh, trying to figure out how we can best take advantage of all the, the different inputs that we could have. Uh, which can come in many different types from many different sources, uh, a wide range of quality, uh, of, uh, of accuracy uh, on them, et cetera. And then on the, the output side, how can we make sure that good performance on paper in laboratory conditions is really going to translate into good results in the real world? Uh, so for instance, there you have the, the Go stuff. How can we make sure that uh, things are going to be reliable and robust and keep getting the, the same performance uh, in the real world situations uh, as they, they seem to under normal conditions. And then more generally, how can we do better evaluation, uh, better benchmarking and testing, uh, and again, make sure that we're going to be really getting good results, uh, not just uh, good numbers uh, in our uh, uh, research papers, for instance. So. You're focusing on the input and the output. In research, I find that a lot of people are usually interested in models. Why are you interested in inputs and outputs rather than the model? And do you think that more people should pay attention to those areas rather than focusing on improving models? So to answer the last question first, I, I do think uh, it's worth uh, more focus. Um, I, I definitely uh, don't mean to say that we should just uh, abandon uh, work on models. Uh, clearly, we're making great progress there. Uh, there's lots of room uh, to, to make many uh, uh, breakthroughs there uh, in the future. Uh, but I, I would say that there, there's two reasons why I think uh, uh, also working on the, the inputs and outputs is important and why I'm focusing on those personally. Uh, so the, the first is just that I think it's uh, less explored. Uh, so 
like you said, uh, lots of people are working on the models. Uh, so I think there's fewer people that are focusing on the, the inputs and outputs, uh, which means that there's perhaps uh, in some ways uh, more stuff to find there uh, and uh, uh, more things that, that we probably want to find there. Uh, and then the second reason is that it seems like uh, stronger models alone is not actually going to be enough in many cases uh, to get the, the real world systems, uh, the real world progress uh, that we want, uh, or at least not, not get it as fast as we want. So we see an example of that uh, in Go, uh, where you have this superhuman model. Uh, nor normally it's superhuman anyways, but then it has these uh, catastrophic failures uh, in, in some situations. Uh, and that sort of thing uh, extends to, to many other uh, situations. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in, in ChatGPT, uh, it can work great normally, mm -hmm. but if you, you know, come up with a, a clever prompt or something, you can make it say something uh, that's completely wrong or that uh, is dangerous. Uh, and in, in general, it, it doesn't work the, the way we want it to work. Uh, so it, it seems like uh, just making better models alone uh, doesn't seem like it, it's going to be a, a lead to a solution there, uh, or at least not not as uh, quickly as we want uh, to to make things better there and in similar situations. Uh, so for that reason, I think uh, by focusing on the, the inputs and outputs, uh, we can uh, maybe make pro uh, progress uh, and make progress faster uh, than if we just focus on the models alone. Can you give an illustration of what you mean by input and outputs rather than the model? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I guess for the the output side, uh, the the Go uh, stuff mm -hmm. can be an illustration. Uh, for the the input side, uh, so some of the the work I sorry, did just to just to cut you on the output side. The output side would then be not trying to improve the model, but trying to analyze the output of an algorithm, like the output of Katago in order to further improve this algorithm. Is, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately it might feed back into uh, yeah. uh, the, the model, mm -hmm. uh, but to, to understand, you know, what, what changes we want to make, uh, uh, we have to understand what we're getting uh, first, uh, I feel like. Uh, so, so for mm -hmm. instance, in, in this research, we found here's a weakness uh, in the, the outputs, right? Here's a weakness in the, the moves it, it plays or the uh, in these particular positions. Uh, and and then we can analyze like, okay, what if we change some things? Uh, is there still going to be this weakness, et cetera? And, and ultimately by understanding mm -hmm. uh, what it's doing uh, on the output side, uh, hopefully we can figure out a way to, to change the model uh, and, and make things better. Okay, no, yeah, super clear. Um, so yeah, go on the input side now. Sorry, I cut you. Sure, so I guess uh, uh, one example is some work uh, I did in the past on uh, misinformation. Uh, so I and uh, uh, colleagues at the, the lab I'm doing my PhD at, the, the Complex Data Lab, uh, looked at uh, the performance that one can get uh, just using a, a straightforward uh, text-based misinformation detection systems and compare that with more complicated uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, misinformation uh, detection or classification systems uh, that might use uh, other uh, inputs as well. And so what we found there was that uh, in many cases, it seemed like the, the relatively straightforward, out-of-the-box uh, text-based systems were actually outperforming uh, some of these uh, more complicated state-of-the-art systems. So it, it seemed like uh, often uh, those state-of-the-art systems uh, hadn't been compared with the, the, the simpler uh, but strong uh, baselines. And furthermore, we found uh, some, uh, uh, at least I don't want to say it's 100% uh, comprehensive, but at least uh, uh, evidence that when the text-based systems work better uh, versus others uh, uh, or when they don't work. And that seemed to be when, if you have a topic that you've seen before, so a topic that's in the training data, then they perform really well. Uh, on the other hand, if you're trying to generalize uh, uh, to a completely un unseen topic, 
then they don't seem to work so well. Uh, and maybe I should clarify uh, that these are so that this was back in uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm talking about uh, transformer based uh, uh, models, but not the most recent ones like a uh, chat GPT, not that type of model. Uh, so anyways, uh, I think this is an important conclusion because in practice, you actually want to be able to detect both types of misinformation. So on the one hand, you may have stuff that you've already seen before uh, that you know is inaccurate, right? Some sort of conspiracy that you've seen before, for example. So you want to, to know if that, that's uh, come up again, uh, and you want to know that that is inaccurate. Uh, on the other hand, though, uh, you also want to be able to detect a new uh, uh, stuff that you haven't seen before, right? If there's some sort of new conspiracy, for instance, uh, or some completely new uh, uh, hot topic in, in the news. Uh, so for instance, if you know, in, in 2020 COVID happens, uh, there wasn't discussion about COVID before then, uh, but we still want to detect misinformation uh, and be able to do something about it. Uh, so, so in practice, both cases are important. Uh, so the, the, the hope is that uh, an understanding like that of uh, when the, just the, the text uh, content based detection uh, works well, versus when you need other information. Uh, so in other words, a, a, a better understanding of the, the different inputs and, and when they work well, uh, will hopefully lead to, to better uh, real world systems. So it looks like overall, it's kind of trying to better understand the models, better understand why they are performing well and where are their weaknesses and looking at inputs and outputs to further improve them, right? Yeah, that's right. And yeah, I think that's quite an interesting topic because in industry, I I realize that you, you're often, you're interested in the model, but training the model in industry is often quite simple. Like for most cases, you're going to have tabular data, you're going to use XG boost or a logistic regression, but training the model will be fine. What you really need to understand if you want to make sure that your model is performing correctly is one, look at the data, make sure that your the data you're training your model on is well processed, clean and reliable. And two, it would be looking at the output. So as we mentioned, making sure that on average your model works well, but also looking at particular examples to make sure that, well, it's not doing anything crazy. Um, well, yeah, and anything crazy, like, I don't know, uh, if it's a self, self-driving self car, it would be driving uh, on the wall or something like that. So you wanna make sure this never happens. So it looks like your research is very tied to industry and perhaps in general, people who are focused on like improving a particular model or archi architectures, this might not be as close to what we're doing in industry. What's what's your take on this one? I would say maybe not a hundred percent, but uh, I think uh, that's uh, definitely has a, a lot of uh, validity uh, in the sense that uh, I think uh, industry is definitely concerned with some sort of real world problem, right? They have to have something that uh, people are going to buy uh, ultimately. Uh, and, and likewise, uh, uh, my research focus, uh, I'm also aiming to uh, really make sure it's something that'll solve a, or make improvements uh, on a real world problem. Uh, so I think in that way, there's a, a clear parallel in the, the goals, even if I'm not necessarily trying to do something that's going to make a product, or, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and then also like you highlighted uh, some of the the, the methods and, and where the focus is uh, can also be parallel. I, I would say that the, there's also some cases which, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it, it, it is it's completely separate from industry, mm -hmm. but there, I think there's other facets to it uh, as well. Uh, so, so maybe one example here is uh, some other work uh, I've been doing trying to understand uh, political polarization, uh, especially political polarization on social media. Uh, and what we're trying to do there is uh, get a more comprehensive picture. Uh, so that there it's more focused on uh, maybe not so much the, the performance of different inputs, uh, but rather how can we look at all the, the different inputs, uh, potential inputs, and, and use them uh, together 
uh, to, to get a, a better picture overall. Uh, so some examples there are we're looking at uh, people's interactions on social media, uh, but also uh, survey data, uh, so what people have said in surveys, uh, and then data on uh, news articles, so what's being discussed in the news versus what's being discussed on social media, uh, and, and in general, different uh, uh, facets of the problem uh, to try and, and get a better understanding and, and ultimately Hopefully, uh, once we have that understanding, once we, we can uh, measure and, and, and better tell what's going on, hopefully we can find ways to avoid a really extreme uh, uh, detrimental uh, political polarization. So what do you mean by looking at all the inputs together? Like, Yeah, so the idea is uh, uh, to try and see, see what each one uh, tells us, basically, in mm -hmm. substance. OK, I see. Uh, so, so for instance, if we look at just the, the social media uh, interactions, then that tells us about a, a particular set of users mm -hmm. uh, and, and how they're interacting. Uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily tell us uh, how the, the traditional media, uh, what role is it playing in pol uh, polarization? Uh, or what about people that aren't as active on social media? Uh, mm -hmm. How are things uh, affecting them or, or uh, what are they? Uh, 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 believe or what role are they playing in this? Uh, so by by looking at those uh, other types of data, like the the survey uh, that can get at people that uh, don't use uh, social media as much, or the the more traditional media, uh, by for instance looking at uh, uh, traditional media websites and and mm -hmm. collecting uh, news from them, uh, then the the ultimate hope, anyways, is that that'll give us a more complete picture uh, that we would miss with just uh, one data type or, or even just a, a small number of them uh, on their own. Is it some kind of like feature importance, like trying to understand what a particular feature of set of data, how one particular set of data is impacting the customers vs another one? Um, is it some kind of feature impact or importance or not really? I would say not exactly. Uh, so the, there's definitely a one parallel uh, in the sense that when you're looking for a feature importance, you're looking at all the, the different inputs and trying to mm -hmm. understand uh, the, the impact that each one has. Uh, but I, I would say in that case, the what you're do, really looking for is like, or what you're probably looking for is the, the ones that are really on the ends. Uh, so the, the ones that are super important uh, or the, the ones that are not important at all and you can throw them out. Uh, the, or, or at least that, that's mm -hmm. my sort of understanding of uh, how it often works. Whereas in, in this case, I mean, m maybe we're not uh, as interested in ones that turn out to be not important at all. And maybe we also want to, to ignore those ones. Uh, but we definitely don't want to just focus on which ones are the most important. We want to understand the whole picture. So we're, we're really concerned about the, the ones in the middle uh, as well. And, and also, it's not really a case where we have all the, the features uh, just being combined and going into mm -hmm. one model. Uh, each one is sort of getting a, a, a different picture, and a, a lot of the work is comparing them at the, the output sort of level. Uh, so you can imagine we have, say, one measure that comes from social media. Uh, so you can see, like, oh, here on this day, there's a, a big spike in, in the measure. So that, that indicates that things were really polarized uh, mm -hmm. uh, on this day. There was a lot of conflict. Uh, for the social media users, at least, and then we then we look at okay, what about the the people in the survey who don't use social media as much? Uh, were things the the same for them? Uh, so then maybe it was like a, a big real world event that affected everyone, uh, or were things different? Uh, so then maybe it was some sort of viral story or, or something uh, that that caused a lot of conflict uh, on social media, but not so much for uh, people who weren't uh, paying attention to social media. And so trying to better understand overall what impacts polarization. That's right, yeah. Political polarization in this case. Right, yeah. So the ultimate goal, of course, uh, we don't want to, uh, even if we could, we don't want to just make everyone uh, think the same and, mm -hmm. and always agree all the time. Uh, that would be completely unreasonable. Uh, but the hope is to uh, avoid really extreme uh, uh, cases that can lead to violence or other harms. So we talked earlier on, on academia and industry. We mentioned that your research has some similarities. It's also slightly different. In general, 
do you think that the two fields are closely related, not related enough? Do you think it's fine um, if they are not related? That's maybe that's fine. Maybe that's how it should be. What's your take on academia against industry? I think that's a can be kind of a difficult question, uh, especially the 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 should part of that. Uh, should they be more or less related? So I, I think uh, in terms of uh, how they are, I, I think there's some of both. So I, I think that on the one hand, there's a, a lot of research that can be quite related to uh, industry, uh, quite close to industry. Uh, for instance, uh, obviously people that actually work at, at companies that are in the, the research mm -hmm. teams uh, are often doing research like you know, ChatGPT would be the, the prime example these days. Uh, so it, it was research on the one hand, but it, it's led to a uh, uh, a big uh, industry product uh, uh, and big changes in industry, uh, and and similarly there can be a, a more people that are more on the academic side, uh, like myself, that are really focused on a, a cl close to applied work and 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 really focused on a, a real world uh, 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 tasks. Uh, at the same time, there can also be lots of uh, much more theoretical research and research that doesn't have a, an immediate uh, direct application. And I, I think that that kind of research, uh, while it's uh, not as much uh, what I'm interested in doing personally, uh, it's definitely not a, a bad thing uh, because uh, one, it can lead to a lot of progress uh, down the road. Uh, so even if you don't see the, the obvious application, uh, just uh, having a better understanding of how things work in general uh, can turn into surprising uh, benefits uh, later on. Uh, and, and also, it, I think it's completely reasonable if someone's uh, just interested in working on some problem. I mean, I mean that's that's completely fair, right? Uh, so you, even if there there is no uh, uh, clear connection to a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of a real world benefit, uh, if it's an interesting problem and advances our knowledge, uh, that's still a, a positive thing. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, I would say that they there's definitely a, a connection, uh, but there can also be a places where they're quite different, right? Uh, some some you know industry thing that's uh, trying to create a product or something like that versus a, a very theoretical problem with no immediate application. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, where they should be, I guess honestly, I don't really have an answer for that. I think. Uh, uh, that's a very hard thing to judge, and I would have to study like the the, the research landscape overall. I, I would say the the one thing I do have an opinion on maybe is uh, uh, research that tries to solve a, a real world problem, uh, but isn't really taking into account the the real world factors uh, involved. Uh, so I, I would definitely say, uh, you know, I, I'm far from perfect on this as well. It's quite hard to take into account all the real, real world factors. Uh, but uh, I think that there can often be uh, uh, research results uh, that are missing uh, key uh, aspects of the problem. Uh, so they, they look, look good on paper, uh, but they aren't going to produce real world results uh, as much as we would hope. So, so ultimately, uh, some of my research, uh, like one of my research goals is to try to uh, uh, make improvements there so how can we bring the the real world and, and the uh the, the research and the, the problems uh, closer together uh, so that they will translate into uh, real world, re, real world uh, results yeah i think it's definitely good i think it's good that there is some research that tries to get closer to industry i also think it's good that some research tries to really be research more theoretical more long term than industry like in industry you're often you're really focused on impact and you need to have impact quickly and very often except those big labs who as you mentioned do some or some labs would do some combination of industry and research most of for most of the industry it's going to be impact and you don't have time to create new models invent new solutions you need to use existing models you fine tune them a bit for your own purpose but you don't have time to recreate things for from scratch whereas in academia you have more time you obviously want to publish a paper but 
it's more longer term, you're less concerned about impact. And so it brings perhaps more creativity. And also, as you mentioned, this longer term effect, perhaps one research is not directly useful today, but it might become very useful in a couple of years. Um, it's also like you don't build chat GPT uh, from scratch. It doesn't go from linear regression to chat GPT. You need lots of research, lots of advances. And at some point you arrive to something very impactful. So I kind of think it's good that we have those longer terms view people who have more time, who can really focus deeply on a specific topic, be per perhaps more creative in ventings. Um, it's also great to have research that ties back to industry because obviously it's always good to have some connection between the two fields. Um, but yeah, I think it's a good thing that industry focuses more on impact research. Some research focuses more on theory, trying to improve knowledge um, and also probably have more impact in the long term. But that's just my take on this. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I, I guess uh, one point to add uh, uh, from the, something you mentioned is that I think uh, uh, research can also uh, sometimes uh, maybe borrow more from industry uh, in terms of uh, how they approach a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what I mean is uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, people in the industry not really having time to develop a you know, whole new architecture or something, uh, but rather just trying to take an, an existing approach and make sure it, it works well on the problem, uh, tuning it, et cetera. Uh, and I think uh, that's something that I would like to see more of uh, uh, in academic uh, research as well. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a lot of uh, cases where uh, the, Researchers, uh, myself included, sometimes can be uh, too focused on trying to make some complicated uh, uh, solution work, uh, trying to make something that's completely new, uh, even though there may be much simpler approaches, uh, existing approaches often that actually work pretty well uh, and work uh, as well or even better sometimes than the really complicated approaches. So I, I talked about that a bit before uh, with the, the misinformation stuff, uh, where we found that out mm -hmm. of the box, uh, basically, what well, we did fine tune them, but uh, not really change the architecture or anything. Uh, transformer based models uh, were performing uh, as well, sometimes better uh, than complicated state of the art ones. And we found similar things uh, in several other areas and completely different domains. And I, I imagine uh, uh, many people can think of uh, examples uh, from their own uh, areas uh, where that happens as well. Uh, so I think uh, in that sense, uh, making sure to really pay attention to the, the, the existing stuff and getting the strongest possible baselines uh, can lead to much better uh, uh, mm -hmm. new models uh, ultimately, uh, because we make sure that they're actually making progress uh, rather than just uh, you know, look, looking good when you put them in a weak comparison, but not actually uh, uh, giving uh, good results compared to everything that's out there already. Yeah, I think it's different. I mean, even in industry, sometimes you always, you see many people who try to come up with something very complex when actually you realize the solution can be quite simple. I guess in academia, there are two things. Well, first of all, people are, very smart, very theoretical, and sometimes you kind of get lost into this theory and really try to perhaps, yeah, forget the bigger goal and do something more complex. I feel there is also this a second point. I'm, I'm, I haven't done a PhD, but I talked to a few PhD students. I might be wrong, but I feel like sometimes if you want your paper to get accepted, you almost almost feels like you need to come up with something complex. And if you come up with something too simple, your paper won't get accepted. And I feel this is, yeah, not great. This is kind of sad, like trying to, obviously if it's more complex and it's better then great, but you don't really need to come up with something more complex. Sometimes something simpler, which does a great improvement is, could be even better than something more complex because obviously the simpler, the more people will understand it, the more it can be, more easily it can be used in industry. So. Yeah, what do you think about this? Is this, is it is this just a feeling or? I, I would say, uh, in my personal experience, uh, uh, I think that's true. Uh, so I, I've definitely gotten comments from uh, reviewers on papers, uh, complaining that there wasn't like a, a very novel model uh, proposed uh, or things to that effect. 
uh, so I, I think uh, ultimately I, I, I still feel there's, there's a call for research like this that, that isn't a proposing model. So, you know, I, I've been able to publish papers, uh, of course, uh, on it and hoping to publish more in the future. Uh, and, and I think especially uh, when it, it's something that is hopefully going to lead to better models uh, eventually. Uh, so if you're just you know testing a few models and you don't have any interesting conclusions, uh, then that's difficult. But if you you find that you know the uh, like the simple model is uh, performing as well as the uh, uh, more complex ones, uh, or you have a better way to evaluate the different models and, and get more insights, uh, then I think uh, that uh, can be published. But there's definitely uh, some sort of barrier. Uh, so I, I hope that in the future, uh, uh, the field as a whole uh, maybe uh, will have more interest in uh, uh, doing really thorough comparisons and, and making sure that we get the, the simple stuff down uh, as well as uh, uh, fancier things. Great. So let's just finish the episode with the same question I ask everyone, one advice, if you just had one advice for someone to progress in their career, what would it be? Just one advice. That's a good question. Uh, so I, I think there's many things uh, that uh, everyone knows, like, uh, you know, if you work hard, if you come up with good ideas, uh, that's obviously going to be helpful. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to give one that I'm not sure if it's like the, the number one thing, but uh, uh, is maybe closer to my personal experience uh, uh, that maybe uh, isn't as standard. Uh, and that's that uh, if you feel like uh, you'd like to change uh, directions at some point, uh, I feel like that's always possible. Uh, that's definitely not to say it's going to be easy. Uh, it's probably going to take a lot of hard work. Uh, there may be uh, many barriers. You may need some luck, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, I feel like many people are for example, starting in one field uh, and then find that they're not uh, as interested in it uh, or they're, they're doing some job uh, and, and not really enjoying it and, and so forth. And, and they wonder, uh, you know, am I really going to be able to switch? Uh, so, for instance, you know, someone feels like, you know, I'm old. Uh, can I really uh, uh, switch fields at, at this point? Uh, or, you know, I have uh, I just got my degree in. Uh, economics uh, to give my sort of situation. Uh, can I really switch to a, a different field? Can I really switch to machine learning? And I would say in my experience, uh, uh, I think it, it definitely is possible. Uh, and if you uh, uh, feel like you, you want to switch uh, uh, fields, uh, I think uh, you can do it. So did you ask yourself those questions before, before switching? W were you in doubt? I guess uh, in, in some ways I, I was in doubt, uh, maybe not 100%, uh, because I, I think uh, I'm, I'm really motivated to try and pursue something that I, I, uh, I'm really interested in and enjoy. Uh, and at least at the time, I, I wasn't enjoying the economics as much uh, personally. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, uh, maybe less doubts. Uh, and I think I, I was also fortunate uh, just to be in a sort of real life situation where uh, it was easier uh, for me than most. Uh, so, so for instance, uh, uh, my parents were supportive uh, and let me uh, move back home uh, uh, for a while uh, so I could uh, I apply to new schools and things like that, uh, which is for many people that's uh, uh, you know not not so easy. You know, if you don't have a job, then how are you going to pay rent? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so, so in in those ways, I was fortunate. Uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I probably did feel some uh, uh, doubts, and I think uh, uh, everyone probably in, in such a situation uh, uh, feels some doubts as well, uh, because it's not easy. It, it can often be a, a really big change. Uh, but at least in my experience, uh, I think I can say now that uh, it worked out uh, for me, and I feel like. Uh, uh, other people uh, uh, as well, if they're motivated to do it, uh, can definitely succeed as well. Well, thanks a lot, Kellen. It was great to have you on the AI Stories podcast and get to record the last episode of season two. 
have a great day in Canada and yeah, hope to catch up soon. Thank you. It was great talking to you.